Well, the Fed didn't drop interest rates as many people expected. I guess the markets, a lot of consumers were hoping that they would because we're bleeding out paying our credit card bills every single month. And now we're going to really see the effects of this bad economy that we've been talking about on this channel for quite some time. People aren't paying their bills. Delinquencies are rising. And to talk about finances, I have nobody special finance. Jack Gamble actually drove in. He's only a couple hours away, which is nice. And we're talking about all of the issues that are as a result of these outrageous interest rates and corporate problems. Hope you enjoy the show. Jack, I love the fact that you can just drive right down the road in a couple hours. You're here in our studio. So awesome to see you again. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Uh, it's good to be back here. I appreciate you having me on. And it's no thing, man. It's a quick drive to get here. So. I want to talk about finance because you specialize in that. And there's a lot going on right now. We have uh, interest rates that have been high for now quite some time. And we're starting to see the impact, obviously, on the real estate side of things. Things are pretty slow. It has picked up because of spring. Uh, it's a spring market, but it's still not like a traditional uh, year for selling houses. What are you seeing with debt and how it's really starting to penetrate the consumers? So, you know, debt only ever grow goes up in this country. Unfortunately, it's a sad state of affairs, whether you're dealing with personal debt or municipal debt or federal government debt, it's just on the rise. And that is in every corner of our economy right now. And the consumer is no different. Uh, you know, just a couple of quick statistics about what the average person's debt is doing right now. Credit card debt in the United States is now at $1 trillion, $48 billion. Um, the most recent data point came out a few days ago. It was down a couple of billion dollars, but it's still trending up and to the right. And that has been just running rampant for the last Really, since middle of 2021, um, we've seen consumer credit card debt rising. You know, there was an in initial wave of debt going down in the United States when all the stimmy cash was flowing and everybody was locked inside. There was nothing to do but pay off credit card debt. And then the inflation kicked in and the credit cards started rising and they haven't stopped. And of course, the big takeaway from that is when the government offers you stimmies, they're not offering you anything. They're just giving you a couple of cents on the dollar that you're going to give back to them in spades in the years ahead in the form of inflation. And inflation is driving up credit card debt wildly right now. And not just credit card debt, we've got this new buy now, pay later thing that's just, it's always been there, layaway's always been a thing, right? The Kmart special and everything. Um, but these new fintech firms offering BNPL loans, that's really catching on. And it was something like $75 billion. We don't know exactly because it's not reported to the credit bureaus. So we don't really know how much is out there. Um, it's estimated to be about $75 billion. And that's everything from consumer electronics, TVs to groceries and even rent now. There are buy now, pay later apps where you can have them pay your rent payment and then make it over several, you know, maybe you get paid in the middle of the month and the end of the month. So you use buy now, pay later to get your rent paid. But really, you're just paying fees and interest on top of that. Uh, so that debt pile just keeps growing. And that is people putting the cost of inflation into the red column on their ledger. They're, they're trying to maintain the same lifestyle they've always had using debt to do that, just <clears throat> hoping things get better. Maybe I get that big raise or maybe things change in my favor. So nobody's really making those lifestyle adjustments yet, although they're just now starting to happen. I think it's fascinating that they're not reporting the buy now, pay later to credit reporting agencies because it's like a ticking time bomb. What's going to happen when people default on those? It's, it's just starting now. The, the regulators, the Office of the Controller of the Currency has put out some, some uh, I forget the name of the document, basically notes to these fintech firms that you should probably start reporting this pretty soon. We're not going to mandate it yet. It's not a law yet, but we strongly suggest which means eventually the regulators are going to come around and start making those demands. Uh, a few weeks ago, Apple Pay became the first buy now, pay later app that is going to be reporting to Experian. I think it was Experian. It was one of the credit bureaus. They're going to start reporting that. So eventually that data will make its way to the credit bureaus. It's not yet. Um, unfortunately, when that debt goes bad, and I think a lot of it will go bad, 
Um, it's non-recourse debt. There's, there's nothing to repossess. There is no collateral that was put up. So really, you know, if you've got somebody who's got lousy credit and a history of not paying their bills, they're probably not going to pay this one either. And what I see a lot of these buy now, pay later firms are doing, they're not banks. They're working with some shady banks out there, like uh, one of the shady banks in the country, Cross River Bank from Fort Lee, New Jersey. Um, they're helping apps like Klarna and uh, Affirm is another big one. They're helping them to take these buy now, pay later loans and securitize them, basically turn them into bonds and sell them. And they're selling them to income ETFs, which typically end up in people's retirement plans. So the banks aren't really sticking around and sitting on that debt waiting to find out if you're going to pay it or not. They're selling it to you, to your retirement. So ultimately, it's the middle class that'll pay for it. So when you're saying these shady banks or whatever, I mean, what? I mean, other than what you just indicated, what what else makes them shady? Uh, so this bank, Cross River Bank in Fort Lee, New Jersey, is is a really and an, a pretty incredible story. There, they came out of nowhere. They were this teeny tiny little bank. They've been around for years, and then all of a sudden, when when the vid hit, right, when everybody started getting sick, and PPP loans became a thing, the payroll protection program. All the businesses could get loans to keep people working. Fed was printing money, giving it to the banks, and loaning it to the government. And so Cross River Bank, this bank nobody had ever heard of, was actually the third or fourth, I forget which one, but third or fourth largest issuer of PPP loans in the country. The three largest were J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, right? The big, giant, megalith banks. And then Cross River Bank from Fort Lee, New Jersey is number four. And this bank, I, I, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but this bank that had 200 employees issued something like 400,000 PPP loans. And what they were doing was they were partnering with the fintech firms that basically said, you guys get your customers to take out a PPP loan through your app. We will underwrite it, rubber stamp approve that thing using our rigorous proprietary process. They swear they're double checking. Um, but really, it was just a rubber stamp for these PPP loans. And they were the fourth largest issuer. They issued billions of dollars in PPP loans during the pandemic for a fee, of course. They'll loan anybody money, collect their fee. And then, of course, the government turned around and bought those loans right back from Cross River Bank. So they never took any of the risk. The taxpayers were immediately on the hook for that. And it's going to take years, decades to prosecute all the fraud that happened there. Um, they were sanctioned by the, I think it was the FDIC or the controller of the currency, sent them a letter saying, you guys need to be real careful with what you're doing here. Uh, cease and desist, essentially. And, uh, you know, now they're doing a lot of things with commercial real estate. They stepped in and filled a lot of the holes in cryptocurrency when Silvergate Bank and Signature Bank went under in 2022. Um, shortly after FTX collapsed, those banks started to go under. Cross River Bank became the biggest banker for Circle, which owns USDC, one of the big stable coins that is driving crypto markets. So these guys have their hands in a lot of pies that are shady areas pushing the limits of what is legal and what isn't. You know, ha has it risen to outright criminality? Not yet, apparently, because they haven't gotten in any direct trouble, but they're really pushing the limits here. And every shady area of finance where there's something risky going on, you'll find that Cross River Bank from Fort Lee, New Jersey is involved. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. What about auto loans? I haven't heard a lot about this in the news. At one point, they were talking about parking lots, full of repossessed cars, that there were more cars up for repossession than they had repo guys, right, to go get them. Somebody told me that they're just not even doing anything about it. Like a lot of the people driving around, their cars are up for repossession. Their tags are expired. Some of them, their driver's license are even expired, and they're just not doing anything about it. I mean, are you hearing this as well? What's the state of the auto industry? Yeah, you know, there was a lot of that in, in 2023 in particular. Um, there's a big auto channel, guys named Lucky Lopez, uh, had a famous video about the massive lots where, you know, the banks were renting out these big lots just to fill them up with repoed cars. Because again, everybody took their stimmy cash, signed up for car payments that maybe they could make at the time when they were getting $300 a month from the government, $600 a month from the government. And then, of course, that changed. The stimmies went away. They're left with the payment. Oh, now I can't afford it. And so these cars started to get repoed. Now, 
we were in a pretty unique situation because we still had the chip shortage or the leftovers of the chip shortage in 2023. So new car prices were astronomically high. Uh, used car prices were through the roof. I mean, there was a short time there in 2023 where a used car was actually a good investment. I mean, historically, you buy a car, you drive that thing off the lot, you just lost $10,000 just from driving it off the lot. In 2022 and 23, we had the case where you buy a used car, by the time you get home, your phone's ringing, the lot wants to buy it back from you for more than you just paid for it. So used car prices were in a bubble. And at the same time, you had these repos were going on. And the borrowers, the lenders, and the, finance, the financiers in auto didn't want to crash the price of the market. So they were repoing the cars, but not putting them all up for auction right away. It was very similar to the zombie homeowner phenomenon after the GFC, where you had a lot of people were staying in their houses. They hadn't made a mortgage payment in two years, and they were still essentially living rent-free in the bank's house. And the bank wouldn't repo the house because the home prices were down. There was no money in it, so they, they just let them stay there until eventually they caught up with them. Well, that's happening now. Now they're eventually catching up. The price of the used cars are starting to come down. In the last few CPI prints, we've actually had some pretty big negative year-over-year -year numbers for uh, used cars in CPI. New cars have stopped going up. I actually I have a buddy of mine. His name's Tom Palella. He runs a company called Car Concierge Plus. He buys cars for people. And he's, I just had him on my channel a few weeks ago, and he was saying the days of paying 10000 over sticker, 6000 over sticker, those are gone now. That there's actually, in, in certain makes and models, there's deals to be had. You can get a car for under MSRP now, whereas a year ago, two years ago, you were paying over MSRP. Used cars are coming down. He's starting to see perks are coming back at the dealership. They're offering free oil changes and those kind of things again. So the auto industry is starting to shift back to a buyer's market here. Hmm. Jack, you bring up an interesting point talking about the GFC and people staying in their houses. I actually know somebody that stayed in a 18,000 square foot house, a very big house for 10 years wow. without paying a mortgage payment. And um, actually a friend of mine. <laughs> but I remember um, what had happened, and, and this is the crazy thing. I'm sure this will all change too moving forward. But there was this big lender, their name was Countrywide. I don't know if you remember Countrywide. And that was one in particular where my friend, where his mortgage was. Well, they wrote so many loans. And basically, in order to, the problem that we had in the GFC is sort of like what we have right now because there are HELOCs and second mortgages on houses and in order to foreclose if there's a house and it has two mortgages on it you have a first mortgage and a second mortgage even if it's a HELOC it's still a secured party to that title for that house if the first position is foreclosing they have to make a deal with the, the second loan either get them to forgive their debt completely or take some kind of settlement to where they can move forward with foreclosure. And back then that was a disaster because there were so many bridge loans and these properties were cross collateralized, a lot of them because people were buying investment homes and things like that. But what interesting enough is they have to find the original paperwork. So in the case of my friend and dozens of other people that ultimately, you know, that um, I know lost their home, they couldn't find the original notes. It took years for them to find the original paperwork in order to actually foreclose and work out something with the second loan. And that's what happened to him. 10 years, he figures that he saved about a million dollars by not paying his mortgage. Now, here's the beauty of How it. How do I get his problems? <laughs> here's the beauty of it, okay? It gets better. Here's the beauty of it. They pay your property taxes because if not, the government's going to take it from the bank they supersede everyone, right? They paid the insurance bill because if something happened to the house that it was uninsured and it burned down to the ground or something, they really lose. But they ended up giving him like $25,000 at the end of a decade to move out, cash for keys. Wow. So not only did he get to save a million dollars in the course of 10 years, but he also got $25,000 cash payment. 
This reminds you of like AIG back in the day. You know what I mean? It's like you can do all these things wrong and then get a nice, you know, take a little trip and go on vacation with a, you know, or go to a cruise with your $25,000 bonus to move out. And he, by the way, he had already moved out at that point. But they didn't know that. So they gave him twenty five grand to live leave a house that he had been staying in rent free for ten years. For ten years and it already left thousand square feet. Yeah, he knew it was coming. Maybe it was fifteen thousand. It's a big house. And they okay. paid him for something he had already done. Vacate the property. Exactly. Again, how do yeah. I get this guy's problem? Yeah. <laughs> Good move for him. I mean, maybe we'll get in a situation where we'll just be able to do that. There's a lot of talk where people are like, Hey, I'll just rack up as much debt as I can right now and I'm just gonna bail out on it because pretty soon you won't. You say buy now, pay later is not attached to your credit report yet. Well, you know what? Pretty soon it may be criminal to even use someone's credit report against them. Man. And, you know, we're seeing something a little similar to that. It, it's on the opposite end of the, the wealth spectrum, if you will. Uh, but we've got situations, particularly in, in some of the blue states, where squatters' rights is becoming a thing, where somebody <laughs> can just basically break into your home and say, it's now my house, and you can't get them out. If you try to get them out, you're going to get yourself arrested. You call the cops. They're going to say, this is a civil matter. And at the end of the day, it becomes advantageous for the homeowner to just write a check to that person to convince them to leave. Yeah, but they got to. Here's, here's the thing. I've heard so many of these stories. I knew some, know someone that got a squatter out of the house, gave him cash for keys. He vacated, broke back in and moved back in again after he was paid to vacate. I talked to somebody else and they said that they um, had someone squatting in their house and they hired professional squatters to break in too. So they occupied with the squatter. And what are you going to do? The squatter going to call the cops and say somebody just broke in and squatting with me? So basically what he said they did was he paid somebody else to break into the house too and say, hey, buddy, you're not supposed to be here and neither are we. And then he just made it so obnoxious that the other people left. I you mean, know, you got to love that. Right? There was a video a few years ago. Uh, this, this journalist um, had a problem with a, or a homeowner had a problem with a squatter, couldn't get her out of the house, was refusing to leave. This person had a violent criminal history. And so this local reporter shows up at the house in a bathrobe with a camera crew and the microphone and says, here's the new house. We're moving in. And the guy just walks into the house and the squatter says, well, no, this is my house. And he says, oh, great. I'm moving in too. It's our house now. We're going to be roomies and sitting there and everything. And well, obviously this interaction, a lot of things happened off camera while this was going on because the squatter was kind of a deer in headlights with a camera crew in her face. Lo and behold, it ends up being that the cops show up. I'm, I don't know if threats were made or whatever, but it turned out this person had a warrant out for her arrest for some violent crime elsewhere. And so the squatter ended up leaving in handcuffs and the homeowner got their house back. Um, but this journalist just showed up and said, my house now, squatter's rights. And he, and he wore a bathrobe for comedic effect. But it, it it's, speaks to the absurdity. And, you know, one of the things that's going on in this country, and stop me if I'm getting a little too political here, but, you know, we have this lurch towards socialism and communism that's going on in the U.S., and the destruction of private property rights is one of the tenets of communism. There is no private property. It's all collective ownership and we all share. And so I think this phenomenon of squatter's rights, the idea that you could save up for your whole life to buy a property and mortgage and everything, and then some person can just take it from you because they exist, is really absurd. And it flies in the face of everything, all the principles this country was founded on. And it's got to stop. It's going to cause big problems in the housing market. Just think about uh, theft in general. You, know, you say somebody can steal your property rights from you. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you're a landlord, it happens all the time. It's called deadbeat tenants. They just don't pay. And sometimes it takes six. I've had it happen six or seven months. One time um, I had a professional. We call them professional tenants. Uh, but this one tenant was an actual parole officer actually worked a government job and um it was a woman she gave me a check for my first month's rent and a check for the security deposit it was only supposed to be her on the lease and her boyfriend and her adult son moved in 
they were required to be on the lease, but I mean, how do you prove that more people are living there, right? She gave me the first month rent and a secure deposit and never paid another penny. And it took seven months about to get her out, them out of the house. And when they moved out, the place needed complete, just about complete renovation. It was, it was really bad. And how does that happen? How can that happen? And, you know, and I've done a lot in Baltimore City. Baltimore City is not um, landlord friendly at all. Uh, you know, I can, I mean, I can go on and on and on about that. You talk about rights. How is it that you can have zero control on who your tenant is and their behavior and the landlord get all of their fines? I've had it where in Baltimore City, they have a big rat problem. I mean, rats everywhere, man. It's a problem. So they said, you have to put your trash in a can and you have to have a lid on it put it out for the trash well i had four houses in a row in one street and they were duplexes so it was eight total units and you know the inspector would come every wednesday down my street and write me i think it was 30 or 35 dollar fines for six of the eight properties i said this is crazy i'm gonna so i provided them all with trash cans well then i were getting the, i was getting the fines because they would lose the lids so then I tethered the lids to the trash can and the trash company refused to take them because they said it was dangerous because the metal lids were tethered on the cans. And when the guys dumped the cans, it was a problem for the trash. You know, I mean, it goes on and on and on. But there, but think about theft because you go to Walgreens now, Rite Aid, you go wherever and everything's behind plexiglass. And the reason is because of the smash and grabs or just the load, put the, you know, load the bags up and walk out the door. If you steal less than a thousand dollars, I don't even think they do anything. Go to Home Depot, go to Lowe's. Everything's under lock and key with no employees to unlock it. So you have got to be massively inconvenienced to shop in America. Now, who's behind that? You know, when you look at Amazon, you know, they, uh, do they just want everybody to shop online? Maybe that's the answer. You know, ultimately, a lot of these laws, they they come from a good place. I, th I think a lot of these, you know, like the idea of not prosecuting minor theft. Well, the idea is our prisons are overcrowded. We don't want to destroy someone's life because they stole something that was only worth a few dollars. We want to target the really serious criminals. And there is a certain wisdom in that and wanting to go after the, the more serious criminals. Of course, the problem is, like anything, the unintended consequences. You just gave a blank check to all the petty thieves. Go ahead, steal up to $999. Don't go over $1,000. you will be fine. Next thing you know, there's nowhere to shop in town because all the business is closed. And, you know, you've got entire neighborhoods in Chicago where there's no grocery stores anymore because the theft drove all the grocers out of business. So they took it too far. You know, I think they were they weren't trying to put all the businesses out of business. I think what they were trying to do was improve relations in the community between the people and the police. It's probably something they need to do in those communities. But at the same time, if you make it so nobody can do business, you're not going to have business. And then it's now a worse neighborhood to live in. And now there's going to be more crime. And, you know, the people there, how are they going to eat? Now the only option to eat is a restaurant or a convenience store far more expensive. You just lowered the quality of life of the people you were trying to help. So, you know, we got to get the emotion out of it in a lot of these laws. And we need to start operating within the world that we live in, not this unicorns and rainbows. Everybody gets along and sings Kumbaya and everything's going to be great. That doesn't exist. We're imperfect beings. There are people among us where if you try to do something nice, people are going to be picking out at the trough to take advantage of your good intentions. And that's when you get things like the organized retail theft and the landlord tenant laws. And, you know, that nightmare scenario you just described with the trash cans and the fines and the damage done to the house and the professional renters, you know, one of the big criticisms or one of the big complaints I've seen in the last few years is everybody talking about how private equity and hedge funds are buying up all the single family homes. And to that, I say, let them. I mean, everybody's saying we need Congress to intervene and everything else. And the scenario you just described, imagine that on a corporate level, are you telling me Blackstone is going to be able to make a profit when they have one property manager managing 100 properties and each one of them has a set of problems like that? You think those predatory tenants 
aren't going to take advantage of corporate lawyers who are more afraid of picket lines and, you know, oh, they're evicting people of a certain demographic. Next thing you know, they're making headlines about that. It's cheaper to just pay them. All these private equity firms and hedge funds that are buying up single family homes right now, they are going to go down in flames and those homes will be available on the cheap when that happens. So I think the solution to the people who are worried about, you know, the institutional money bidding up the price of homes, I think step back and just grab some popcorn and watch. I think we're in for a pretty, uh, a lesson in landlords here. And, you know, one of your guests on your channel said something a few weeks ago, it was probably a few months ago now, landlords provide a service. They, you know, they get drag through the mud because there have been abusive landlords, just like there's abusive tenants. There have been bad ones that took advantage and hurt people and treated people poorly. But at the end of the day, if there's no landlords, there's no places to rent, there's nowhere to live. And so if you put the landlords out of business, you're going to end up with an even worse housing shortage than you started with. I think the and you're exactly right. I think the issue is, is that should they be in single family home rentals well and then you have mom and pop and you have some pretty big mom and pop ones as well i mean there are some mom and pop landlords that have 500 700 thousand doors i mean they're considered mom and pop but uh, they're not blackstone or a wall street type of company a hedge fund <clears throat> but i think the issue is like you said it's not easy it reminds me of you know um when you get out of your game and get into someone else's game, you become fair game. It, it, it almost reminds me, it's like that leech buddy of yours, right? Not you, but I'm just saying in general, that sees everything that you're doing and says, ooh, I want to get in that. Or, oh, yeah, oh, I see a lot of opportunity. I want to get in that, right? Well, what happens is when we had the great financial crisis and all of the houses were being foreclosed on, the Obama administration, and I'm not blaming Obama. I'm just saying it's, it's just a fact. I mean, I think Obama was handed a, a, a big bag of crap. I mean, it, it, right? I mean, that's what happened, mm -hmm. right? I mean, Obama takes office and boom, it, one of the worst financial crises post-World War II. And I think what, what happened was they didn't know what to do with all this inventory that was uh, plaguing the neighborhoods. And you remember, I mean, the grass wasn't being cut. The banks had to mow the lawn. The banks had to board up things. The banks had to close swimming pools. The banks had to do all kinds of things. Worry about squatters being in the house. Uh, change keys. Everything was ripped out of the house. The plumbing was gone. The, you, the, the appliances were gone. The, if it was a nice roof, that was gone too. It, because people were like stripping the properties of everything that they had. So it was a plaguing issue across the country. Well, what happened was they, they bundled up all of these properties, these bad notes, and they sold them to Wall Street. And they said, look, we are going to give these to you, not give them, but sell them for pennies on the dollar. And basically what you're going to have to do is you need to, you're going to need to rent them to the people that lost them. Not exactly the, the, your house that you're not renting your house that you lost, but it was a lot of homeless people at that point that were displaced, families that were displaced. And it was the way of opening up in the administration's eyes, opening up the ability to get these people back into a single family home again, in a lot of cases, well, they just tasted as like a vampire tasting blood because they saw nothing but profitability. They bought them for cheap. Right. And then what happened was through the next couple of years, they, they said, look, this is great. We're not going to sell them because now we're making money. And then what did they do? They saw price appreciation like they never have. So if you go back to 2011, 2012, where are we now compared to then? So these Wall Street companies not only made money in rentals, got these assets for pennies and nickels on the dollar, but then they are in looking at, wow, we made a lot of money here, right? Well, what did that do? Well, that spawned all the fractional investment companies, all of the you know other companies to say, look, all these guys, man, they're making. So it just made available billions of dollars for buying up single family housing. I think the issue is now, like you said, what do you do at that point? They should be restricted to multifamily, but you can't, I mean, how do you do that? Then it's against capitalism. And that's what we're supposed to be. And people, the comments are gonna light up right now. There is no capitalism, capitalism sucks. And by the way, talking about the, the theft, you should see on my channel, Jack, the amount of people that defended. I just had Peter Schiff on my live show, 
And Peter Schiff was talking about that. Wall, you know, like the stores and everything's locked up. And, you know, uh, people were defending it. They're like, well, these nobody talks about these Wall Street guys that are making all this money. They're stealing from everybody. Why can't we walk in and steal? Yes, he does. Nobody does talk about them a lot. <laughs> Sorry, I'm nobody. <laughs> I mean, right. <laughs> it's not an excuse for petty theft. Right? It's not an you know? excuse. Yeah. You know, where did we learn that if somebody comes up and, do- and wrongs you that you double wrong them back? It's called whataboutism. And uh, it- it's-, it's a pretty lame excuse for-, for ripping off a store. And you're destroying your own neighborhood when you do that. Because that store is going to go out of business. And now grandma's got to walk even further to get a prescription filled. Because the pharmacy... You know, that was on the ground floor of the building she lived in went out of business because too many people robbed it. So, you know, the people that are robbing those businesses saying, well, look at Wall Street and therefore I'm justified. Go try that with grandma and see what grandma says. All right. Grandma's probably going to take her flip flop off and smack you upside the head with it. If you try that noise with grandma, because she knows you're full of it. That is a lame excuse. Yes. Wall Street is crooks. I talk about them all the time. We should prosecute them. It is not an excuse to not prosecute people who are breaking the other laws. Uh, now, on the, on, again, on the subject of the, the institutional money and the single family homes, again, I got to come back to the law of unintended consequences. If we do something like, say, institutional buyers are not allowed to buy single family homes anymore, we don't know what kind of trouble that's going to cause. I can tell you the big institutions, Blackstone, BlackRock, they own enough politicians. They'll carve themselves out an exception. They'll figure it out. And it'll end up being your buddy, the landlord with the 500 doors, who somehow has managed to make that business model scale. I'd love to talk to him because I don't think that business model does scale very well. He'll end up being driven out of business. Blackstone and BlackRock will buy up his assets for cheap when he's forced to sell because of the new law. It happens that way every time. And that's why the solution is not more government restrictions on capitalism. I think they are going to fail miserably, these institutions buying up these houses. And in the story you told about how after Obama came in and they were offered to buy up those houses on the cheap, bought up on the cheap was the the key there to that working because they bought after the crash. All these firms that are buying right now are buying at all time historical highs. They're buying at a time when nobody can afford the rents that they're going to have to charge to make those houses cash flow positive. They are going to be burning capital like you wouldn't believe And I'm telling you, all these houses that they're buying, they're all going to start hitting the market at the same time when these firms are desperate for capital. And uh, I I don't think more laws is the solution. I think let bad businesses fail and then let smart people take advantage of that is the way to do it. I couldn't agree more, Jack. I mean, I've never been one for bailouts. Let's kind of wrap up and talk about the stock market. Um, You follow that pretty closely. I don't know how anybody could feel comfortable getting in right now. It's like the housing market. I get people that ask me all the time, Todd, when should I buy a house? Should I buy a house now? Um, What's a good deal? You know, the issue is if you look at the historical data, if you're buying a house right now, there's a possibility that you're buying at the top. Nobody has a crystal ball. Eventually, it's going to continue to go up from even where it is right now. But how long will that be? Will it be five years, seven years, a decade or more? Will we see major recession, pull those prices down before they go back up again? Is the stock market the same way? Yes. The stock market, in my opinion now, is the most overvalued it's ever been. And we are, in certain terms, even worse than the dot-com bubble. There's there's a, a very famous quote. Uh, from the former CEO of Sun Microsystems. It's a long quote, so I'm paraphrasing here. But the, the synopsis is, what the hell were you thinking? And the CEO of Sun Microsystems said, my company was trading at 10 times sales, which means if I had no cost of goods sold, if I had no rent, no electric, if I had no payroll, if I had no taxes, if every dollar my company took in, I could give back to my shareholders as a dividend it would still take me 10 years to pay them back what they were earning on that stock. The multiple. What the hell were you thinking? NVIDIA is 40 times sales right now. So in that same scenario, if NVIDIA had no cost of goods sold, no employees, no taxes, no nothing, no overhead, it would take 40 years at their current rate of sales to pay back what people are paying for NVIDIA stock. Now, Most of these gains in the stock market have been from what's known as the MAG-7, the Magnificent Seven. That's the phrase being thrown around. Seven companies, 
uh, Meta, Microsoft, uh, Alphabet, Tesla, Nvidia, Apple. There's a, there's one or two other ones, but now it's down to the Mag Six because Tesla has fallen from grace as the EV bubble is popping. Fewer and fewer companies are making up more and more of the gains in the stock market, which means we call that nuclear power a single point vulnerability, one component that could fail and take down all the safety systems altogether at once. You, you want to avoid a single point vulnerability. Well, there are six companies now that represent a massive sort of Damocles hanging over the entire stock market. And the biggest of them is NVIDIA. And what NVIDIA is doing right now, and I catch a lot of heat for talking about this on my channel, um, what NVIDIA is doing right now is almost identical to what some of the worst offenders were doing in the dot-com bubble. They are making strategic investments in their customers. Well, they'll say to their customer, this one company called CoreWeave, they said, we're going we're gonna to buy $2 billion worth of your company. And then CoreWeave takes that $2 billion investment from NVIDIA and turns around and buys NVIDIA's GPUs with that money that NVIDIA just gave them. So NVIDIA is basically taking their own money in the form of revenue. It's called round tripping. It's the circular movement of the same money where the company gives their money to the customer, the customer gives it right back, but it looks like organic revenue growth. And in the last quarter of last year, NVIDIA did that with 11 different customers. And on top of that, those, those are some of their smaller customers. On top of that, NVIDIA's biggest customers, Microsoft, Amazon, they're all designing their own chips right now, which means within a few years, NVIDIA's biggest customers are going to be their biggest competition. And they're trading at multiples that are even worse than the dot-com bubble. To call this market top-heavy is not to do it justice. Now, nobody cares right now because they're all riding the gravy train. NVIDIA stock is on a one-way, nonstop course to $1,000 a share. At some point, that's not going to work. At some point, that's going to stop. It always ends the same way. And it is the most crowded trade in history right now. Every fund manager on Wall Street is piling into NVIDIA stock because they're afraid of being the only one that isn't, hmm. which means they're not really buying a company. They're just jumping off the bridge because everybody is. And sooner or later, these AI investments need to start showing a profit. Now, I think artificial intelligence, the technology will eventually do amazing things. Um, some of these things like automated programming, uh, uh, virtual assistants, AI virtual assistants that you can program to talk to you a certain way. You know, these things could be great productivity enhancers that will generate a lot of income and a lot of revenue. But that's not what we have yet. Those are all things that are coming. Maybe they'll be here soon and maybe they'll make a lot of money. Instead, what we have are these AI chatbots that give you a different answer to the same question every time. We have AI image generators that are producing what I refer to as ethnically ambiguous historical figures, you know, like an Asian female George Washington, because they're afraid of putting pasty faces on the internet. These things are a joke. And they just drew all this attention to how they were wasting their investors' money by buying Super Bowl commercials a few months ago, right? That's the same thing that happened in the dot-com bubble when Pets.com pointed out how much of their investors' money they just wasted, $7 million on a 30-second ad slot. Uh, same thing in 2021 with the Super Bowl, or was it 22, that with the uh, Crypto Bowl. And when FTX and all the other you know, big crypto firms spent all this money on Super Bowl advertising, the same thing just happened with AI. All the signals are there. there. There's so many of them, but everybody's making money and nobody cares. And out of every single analyst, I think there's 38 Wall Street analysts are tracking NVIDIA stock. At 40 times sales, not one of them has a sell rating on that company. 36, I think have a buy and two have a hold. Wow. Not one is saying sell at 40 times sales because they're all afraid of being the only one saying sell. That has, that's groupthink. That's people are self-censoring because they're afraid to, tell, to say what their eyes and ears are telling them. Um, some of these people that are investing in AI, some of the people that are round-tripping cash with NVIDIA are, in my opinion, some of the lowest of the lowlifes in the world, crypto scammers, um, people who made money tra trading carbon credits, shady hedge funds. It's going to come to a head at some point. I think it'll be very soon. Now, I've been saying this since NVIDIA was $500 a share. Now it's 900 So, you know, up until this point, I've been wrong. But when the market comes to its senses, the last thing in the world you want to be holding is NVIDIA stock. Yeah, the last thing you want to do is be buying anything at the top of the market. In any case, it's sometimes not the easiest thing to time. Uh, but if you know, right, if people want to be risky and believe it, then you know, go for it. Uh, but I think you're right. Just like 
the potential for banks to be taking people's money over $250,000. I mean, will the government continue to pay everybody's deposits no matter how much you have with the bank? I mean, everything is good until it isn't, right? Until all of a sudden we're like, oh, no, this is a problem. And uh, But uh, we're, we're not learning great lessons here in life. We're obviously you know, accepting the fact that we can misbehave and be bailed out and not pay our bills and we're kind of going in a weird direction with everything but you know jack it's always a pleasure man to have you on and for anybody that's listening i mean obviously proceed with caution when they're talking about investing your money and and uh, we'll watch and see how everything plays out time will tell all right man all right. thanks so much thanks for having me on it's always right. a pleasure yes sir Wow, huh? Jack is pretty dynamic, knows so much. It's such an honor to know him. If you enjoyed the video, you can smash that thumbs up and let Jack and I know that you did. Drop your comments below. We love to read them. And if you haven't already subscribed to our channel, what are you waiting for? Go ahead, do so now, please. We'd love it for you to be notified every time we upload content just like this. So hit that alert bell when you subscribe. And one of the biggest compliments you could do for me personally is share this video with your family and friends, guys, because this is not stuff that you're hearing in mainstream media. You have to search channels like ours on YouTube. All of Jack's information is below in the show notes. Cruise on over, subscribe to his channel. Tell him Sax Realty sent you. See you next time. Sachs Realty, Maryland Broker, number 607720, office number 443-318-4514, equal housing opportunity.